Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Beyond Some Figures podcast. So it was interesting as I was gearing up for today's guest. I've had his book on my desk for the past seven years or so. In fact, his book, The Coaching Habit, has been a staple not only in, in my industry for coaching, but it's also been used throughout organizations on how to level up their team members and so forth. He just three months ago released this other book called How to Work with Almost Anyone. He is founder of Box of Crayons, MBS Works, which we'll dive into a little bit more. He's one of the original cohorts of Marshall Goldsmith's MG100. He's been a senior consultant, all this other fun stuff. We can keep going on and on. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Michael Bengay Stenier. Charles, thank you. It's so cool that you made that connection with the Coaching Habit book, which was this miraculous breakthrough book for me because I uh, pitched it to a publishing house and they turned me down seven times. So in the end, I self-published it because I'm like, you know, I'm sure there's something good in this book. And actually through the IP from the Coaching Habit book is a key way that I scaled my first business. So everything that people are going through, I'm kind of going through as well. So I'm glad to be here. Is it still self-published? You never yes. went the traditional publishing route? No, you know, a year into it, one of the big publishing houses came in and they said, we'll buy this book for you for $100,000. And I was like, I have always wanted a six-figure offer for a book. But then I was like, but I'm not sure why I would say yes to that because all you're doing is giving me cash up front. So I would then more than like, drop my royalty rate by more than 20%. I would lose control of the book. I would lose a connection to the book. I'd have to start working with a big, slow-moving organization. I'm like, oh, man, it, I've never walked away from 100 grand before, but I walked away because I'm like, I want control over this book. I want to get it out into the world, and I've got to – and it matters less for me to optimize the revenue than to optimize the reach for what that book is about, and continuing to own it gives me that control. Now, you're one of the lucky few that were actually able to sell over a million copies. Right. So many people set out to write a book and become wealthy writing books only <laughs> to realize that you don't get wealthy you don't. from writing books. You get wealthy because you wrote a book right. if you play your cards right. When you set out to write the book, did you set out to write the book to sell a million copies or did you set out to write the book to build thought leadership? It was the second. I mean, I reckon, having now written eight or nine books, I think anybody who can write a book, A, celebrate that. <laughs> sure. Secondly, if you can sell more than 10,000 copies of your book, that already puts you into an elite. But actually, for most people, you shouldn't even care about your book sales. It's like, have you got your book into the right hands of the right people? Sure. Because, you know, I can point to 10 specific people who I know who got a copy of the book and then went on to spend more than a million dollars on behalf of their organization with box of crayons to buy training services and the like to scale coaching through their organization. So I'm like, if I had just sold 10 copies, but I'd sold those 10 copies to those 10 people, it would be a $20 million win already. So much of it depends on defining what success is before you start chasing something. So for the seven, eight figure CEOs that are listening right now, would you advise them to write a book? I'd advise them to get really clear on what success means for them around that. Because mm -hmm. some people are like, I want to write a book because I want to have a book with my name on it. And I want to give it to my wife and my kids and my brothers and my parents and all my relatives during the holidays. And that is success. Or you might go, look, I want to codify some key insight about my industry and I want to create authority there. I want to be a figure where people go, I'm going to hire you in some way because you prove that you know something, being able to buy some authority of yours. And that's a great idea. It's like an ecosystem. But if you're, just as you said in the intro, Charles, you know, if you're like, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to become famous and people are going to know me. And I'm like, well, probably not. And also I just say, writing a book is miserable. It is a miserable experience. <laughs> so there's another question, which is, if you want to be a thought leader, what is the best format for you to show up 
as a thought leader. Like so developing a point of view and developing intellectual property, IP, can be really smart. But then you go, of all the formats, what's the best format for me to get that out to the people who I'm trying to touch? Sure. In 2016, I was invited to be a speaker at one of the world's largest associations for a particular industry. And he asked me if I would be a breakout speaker. And so I said, hey, you know, okay. I said, would it be okay if I talked about my book while I'm there? And he goes, wait a minute, you have a book? And I said, I do. It's the Predictable Profits Playbook. And he said, hold on, let me get back to you. I got to talk to the board. He right. spoke to the board and he came back and he goes, would you be interested in being the keynote? Right. It's like, would you like to turn left and go up to business class instead of, we were going to put you down in the economy, but now we're going to upgrade you because you've got an authority and right. that's a big win. That was the first big aha moment for me. This is, I was just getting the book out there and I'm like, wow, yeah. the perceived difference in thought leadership when you have a book, when you don't have a book. And I spoke on stage with the former CMO of Harley Davidson, you know, I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. You know, yeah. I don't often get compared to other business coaches just because we specialize in seven and eight figure companies and it do requires a different skill set. So we don't oftentimes get compared very much. But on, on the occasion when we do, they'll ask me questions about, like, you know what, this person's actually right. And yeah. in many ways, they're very brilliant. Here's the thing though, I wrote the book on it. Right. So if you'd like, I could send you a copy. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, what? <laughs> I, I literally wrote the book on it. I could yeah. send you the copy. And then it just changes the overall perspective. So there is a big win. You become, it's a lot easier to attract media attention and so forth yeah. because they would rather promote the book than the business. And, that's and, business. And, and what's so helpful to know is in your business, who do you serve and who your key customer really is? Because- yeah. The more specific you can make all of that, the more likely it is that your book will be known in the small pond that is your target market. And every time you try and genericize the wisdom that you have, you actually lose a chance of actually striking a chord rather than gain a chance. Talk to me about the book. You said the book influenced scaling your business. Yeah. So part of the reason the book succeeded, probably a couple of reasons. One is my goal was to write the shortest book I could that was still useful. The second was I had a really specific and clear idea of who I was writing this book for as a very targeted type of person in an organization. Third And thirdly, because I'd been teaching it for five or six years, all the edges were sanded off. Like my ideas were really polished. They'd been tested with reality. What happened with the getting the book out in the world is that it claimed this IP. It forced me to name it and set it and claim it. And one of the things that we shifted as a company is we went from really selling training to actually thinking of ourselves as an organization that licenses IP. So we still deliver, we still have a kind of core training offering. And we do that in person or virtually or through a digital offering. But actually, we keep realizing that the relationships with our clients is access to the IP. And so that opened up different channels for us to sell the book or different channels in which our clients could buy content from us and build longer term relationships with us. So that codification really allowed for a kind of bump up in scale. Got it. And so the coaching habit, how would our seven, eight figure CEOs and founders listening, how would they integrate the coaching habit in a way that could help them further reach their goals? At the heart of the coaching habit is a behavior shift. And the behavior shift is, can you stay curious a little bit longer? And can you rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly? Because the longer you can stay curious, great things happen. One is you keep giving other people responsibility and accountability that is appropriately yours. Yeah. And secondly, you get clearer about solving the real problem. Because for an organization to scale, you have to be working on the right stuff. You have to have a good strategy and you have to have a good culture. And a good strategy is, are we solving the right problems? And what will happen in most organizations is people, where there's this orientation towards action, is we just get, we crack on with it. We get going. We try and figure stuff out. And it means that in many organizations, everybody's working really hard and being really brilliant to solve the wrong problem. And one of the things that makes you scalable as a leader 
is if you become known for being the person who figures out what the right problems are rather than the person who has all the answers. Mm. Because your organization has all the answers. Your organization can access all the answers. If you can be the person who says, I'm going to make sure we're working on the right stuff, then you really earn your stripes as a CEO or as a senior leader. But you don't want just the right strategy. It's not just having the right work. You want to have the very best people working on the real problems, strategy and culture. One of the things that curiosity does is it actually allows people to step up and be seen and actually take ownership for that work. So you get to keep the very best people for longer. You have the very best people working on the real challenges. Then you're giving yourself the ability to really scale and make a difference in your work. I had a recent aha moment and I had made a comment and the team fired back with a response and I immediately got triggered and I fired back to them before you respond, ask yourself, why did I say that? Mm -hmm. And as soon as I wrote that, I stopped and I had to go check myself Right. and I needed to ask myself, why did they respond in the way that they right. did? Right. So when you talk about being more curious, I find the biggest problems I get into happen when the curiosity door slams and the reaction <laughs> opens Right. instead of asking why, like, yeah. why did they say that? And usually why is not what I assumed. For me, you, I'd actually tease those two things apart because I think they're both really powerful. One is the value of staying curious longer. The second is the value of slowing down being reactive. Right. Because being reactive kills you. <laughs> yes. To be clear, you know, when I say curiosity is important, I'm not saying never give advice. I'm saying you don't want advice giving to be your instinct the whole time. And it is for most of us. I, in another book, I talk about it as the advice monster. You know, somebody starts talking and about three seconds into it, your advice monster looms up out of the dark and goes, oh, I'm going to add some value to this conversation. Here we go. Yeah. You know, they're only four seconds into it, but you're already kind of reacted to the advice given. This is a bit of an aside, but let me share the model that I find most useful in helping manage my reactivity. Please. It's a model called the Karpman Drama Triangle. It's got its roots in something called TA, transactional analysis, which gives us the language of adult to adult relationships and parent child relationships, which is kind of interesting, but it doesn't really work in organizational life. But the drama triangle, I think can, because it says when things get dysfunctional, three different roles play out. There's the victim, there's the persecutor, and there's the rescuer, victim, mm -hmm. persecutor, rescuer. And in a single interaction, you can play all three of those roles, but you'll probably have a default role, a role that you go to most often. So the victim, you know what that person looks like, right? Like whiny, complainy, it's so hard, it's not fair. They're all about kind of like feeling powerless. And there's actually advantages to playing that role because you attract people trying to fix you and save you and people come and do your work for you. But the price you pay is that you feel like you've got no control over your life. You have no power. You're just flotsam and jetsam on the river of your organizational life. Then there's the persecutor, you know, which most obviously is the kind of shouty, finger waggly, you know, kind of person. But more subtly is things like a micromanager. There are advantages to playing the persecutor role because you get to be right, and you get to be righteous, and you get to be angry, and you get to feel smarter and better than everybody else. I mean, you know, the only reason anything gets done around here because I'm surrounded by turkeys is because I'm brilliant, and if things go wrong, you can blame everybody else. The price you pay for being a persecutor is being lonely and being isolated, and you know when the whipping stops, everybody goes home, so the work doesn't get done. Plus, you get to do everybody else's work because you don't really trust them. Mm. And then the third role is the rescuer, which sounds slightly better than the first two, but it is equally dysfunctional <laughs> as the first two. And the rescuer is the, let me jump in, let me fix it, let me solve it, let me save the day, let's not have a conflict, let me take it on. And the advantage for a rescuer is you're like, you, it's quite a controlling little role because you've got your fingers in everybody else's pie and you feel like it's only your noble actions that's keeping the whole thing going. But the price is rescuers create victims, and rescuers create persecutors. Plus, you're so exhausted from doing everybody else's work, you never get around to doing what your work is. 
And what I find is that when you are in reactive mode, you're being triggered into one of those roles of the drama triangle. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you start noticing what, what did they say and what did I say and what roles are playing out in this drama triangle, it actually helps you understand the dance, the drama, and sometimes that can help you pull out of the dance and the drama a little more quickly. That's fascinating. So let's shift gears just a little bit. Sure. When you talk about knowing leaders need to know how to identify the problems, know how to ask the right questions and yep. so forth. While that has been the case for a long time, I find that the advantage is going to go to the leaders that know how to ask the right questions and look for problems in 2024 and beyond, largely because of AI. Right. And with AI, there's answers all over the place. I want people to hear that. So if you can ask the better question and figure out the better challenge, then that's where the advantage lies. So really, it's about asking the better question. It, because it's not the tool itself becomes a level playing ground. Everybody's right. going to have the same tool. So right now, it's those people who are using it or having the advantage, whether or not they're using it correctly or not. Just right. using it gives them a huge advantage. Agreed. But then eventually, everybody's going to use it. And so the right. advantage becomes leveled off. But there's always going to be a certain percentage of people that are going to be able to ask better questions that are going to get a superior advantage over everybody else. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like a perfect example. Somebody sent me, we have a prompt for a, a super consumer, an AI super consumer. They ran the whole prompt and like, this is great. And it's like, well, before you continue, there's one word that you may want to consider adding to your profile right. to see what changes. And so their super consumer was, they labeled it as an executive. And I'm like, I think you need to add a busy executive in front of it. Nice. And when they added the word busy, the entire profile changes and everything yeah. shifted. How does somebody build that muscle of curiosity to the point where they know how to ask the questions mm -hmm. that they should be asking? Tell us where I would go with that is rather than building muscle, what I'm interested in is what do I need to remove so asking questions feels an easier act. This is actually a kind of strategic insight, which is like often there are two ways to an outcome. One is by adding stuff. And one is by removing stuff. Human beings are wired to add, but often the interesting question is what do I need to stop doing? What do I need to remove? What do I need to get rid of as a, a different route to get there? I mean, everybody gets asking the power of asking questions in theory. Everybody gets it in theory. I'm like, so in practice, what keeps getting in the way? And this idea of the advice monster might be helpful for people because I think there are three different advice monsters that show up. There's tell it, save it, and control it. There we go. So tell it is the kind of the, the ego state, if you like, that kind of belief that the way you add value is to be the person who has the information, who has the knowledge, who has the answers, who has the solutions. And your reputation and your status and your authority and your right to be in the position you're in is entirely determined by the fact that you need to have all the answers to all the problems all the time. The second is kind of connected to the drama triangle and it's save it, which is like your job is to protect people from everything all the time. There can't be any stress. There can't be any confusion. There can't be any mess. There can't be any mistakes. You got to keep everybody safe from everything all the time. And then the third one is the control idea, which is like, your job is to keep your hand on the wheel. <laughs> so your job is to maintain control from the start through the middle to the end all the time. Control everything. You can tell by the over dramatic way I'm saying this is like, these are all impossible. It's impossible to have all the answers. It's impossible to save all the people. It's impossible to control all the things. They've all got an element of value to them. Like there's times where you want to be the person with the answer. There are times where you want to have people's backs. There are times you want to assert control. Often the thing that keeps us reacting to giving, telling people stuff rather than asking a question is our advice monster jumps in to protect our ego, protect our control. So part of building the muscle or building the experience to kind of stay curious longer is becoming better at sitting with the ambiguity of that moment right after a question is asked. When you ask a question, there's this moment of, was that a good question? 
Why is there this awkward silence? What happens if they don't know the answer? What happens if they come up with a stupid answer? What happens if I don't understand their answer? There are these moments where you're like, this is uncomfortable. I'm not sure what's going on. The ability to sit with that discomfort is actually the deeper kind of practice beyond just knowing some good questions to ask. And speaking of questions, I know that you work with people that are often asking themselves things like, I feel like I have more to contribute. Or they might be saying something like, I feel like I've settled. How do I kind of shake things up? Mm -hmm. Or maybe they want to challenge who they are today so that they can grow into the person that they want to be, or even just use all that power and everything they have for that, making that positive change. And you do that through mbs.works. That's right. But tell me more what that is. And then how do you take somebody from complacency to realizing that potential? mbs.works is more about what kind of two things really. One is helping people unlock their greatness, kind of take on the next big thing. And the other is helping people in smaller companies have practical coaching skills to actually work with people. So the question you're asking is like, so how do you get people to that next level to step up and to kind of be ambitious for themselves and for the world? And I think there are two tools that I can offer people here. One comes from a book I wrote way back when, 15 years ago, called Do More Great Work. And it's a really simple tool, but can be really powerful. And it's simply this, everything you do falls into one of three different buckets. It's either bad work, good work, or great work. Bad work is mind numbing, soul sucking, life crushing, waste of time bureaucracy. Sadly, everybody has bad work in their life. Good work is your job description. So it's productive and it's efficient and it's getting things done. And then there's great work. Great work is work that has more impact and more meaning. And that kind of double definition really matters. So one of the, one simple tool to help unlock other people's potential and ambition is to just get them to draw a circle and then say, tell me how you're spending your time at the moment. Most people are overwhelmed by good work, but now you're in a position to be curious to say, so tell me about your great work. What is the work that has impact and has meaning for you? And what does it mean for us to try and expand that so that we can actually think about how do you take that further? Mm -hmm. So that's one framework of doing that. A second tool that people can use, similar but different, is now we're using a classic two-by-two matrix. So imagine a box and then draw a cross in it. So you've got got four boxes within the big box. And it's helping people articulate the difference between what are you good at and what are you fulfilled by. So let's imagine good at is along the vertical axis, plus minus, and fulfilled by is on the up and down vertical axis, plus minus. This is the stuff that I know how to do, and I love doing it. You hope that they've got nothing in the not good at and not fulfilled by. But what's interesting is in the plus minus combinations. So you can have a conversation with something that's like, I'm good at this, but I'm not fulfilled by it. Yeah. That means that you've hit the top of the plateau. You're like, I can do it. But if you keep me just doing this, I'm going to feel really stuck and I'm going to feel really demotivated. Mm-hmm. And then in the other one, which is like, what am I fulfilled by, but not yet good at? People don't often talk about that, but in fact, that's their learning edge, right? That's the thing they're hungry to do more of. In that conversation, you're like, let me give you this piece of work to do, but let me give you guardrails and a safety net and coaching and training and quality assurance. Cause you're not yet good enough to do this unsupervised. But I know that this is what's going to light you up and you're like, this is where you're going to take off and learn and grow and really contribute in an important way. Oh, awesome. So I know we're pushing up against the clock and you're a busy guy. Where this is the Beyond Seven Figures podcast, what would you say is your biggest best tip for our listeners who want to take their business beyond seven figures? Well, I can tell you the thing that has made the most difference for me is a combination of things. I hired a CEO to run one of my businesses, Box of Crayons. And we hired somebody who did a two-year transition to make sure that as the founder, I didn't screw up hiring a new CEO because founders are a nightmare. We defined a decision tree. So this comes from an author called Susan Scott and Fierce Conversations. And tree has four parts, twigs, branches, trunk, and roots. And we assigned 
decision-making responsibility to the four parts of the tree. Twigs, I would never hear about. Branches, stuff I would hear about eventually, like trunk are decisions that Shannon, the CEO, would discuss with me, but they were her decisions to make. And then root decisions were my decisions to make as the founder and as the owner of, of the company. And what was in what part moved around a bit, certainly in the first couple of years. But getting really clear about what decisions I wasn't allowed to make was what allowed me to trust Shannon with the business and allowed that business to really grow in scale. I think that's brilliant. Who's the author of that book again? Uh, her, her name is Susan Scott, and the book is called Fierce Conversations. That is brilliant. And kudos to you for knowing the question to ask <laughs> and the resource to support that answer. So that was brilliant. Oh, good. And people want to learn more about you and the work that you do. Where do we send them? Yeah, so the web website is the same as the company name, so mbs.works. I've written a bunch of books, and all of the books have free resources associated with them, so you can kind of connect in there and find your way to all of the books there. And Coaching Habit videos of the new book, How to Work with Almost Anyone and How to Build the Best Possible Relationship, all of that stuff is at mbs.works. Awesome. So that's mbs.works. Now, your Coaching Habit book, that's still a bestseller years and years later, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Like the other day I looked and it was ranked 350 on Amazon.com. Awesome. Michael, thank you very much for being here as a guest of the Beyond Seven Figures podcast. This was uh, a lot of fun. We covered a lot, a lot of different things. My biggest takeaway from today is just a reminder that the reminder of the power of curiosity yeah. and to stay as curious as possible. We know that's a competitive advantage. It's only building more and more answers become easier to have access to. That's beautifully uh, said. So thank you, my friend. Yeah, thank you, thank thank you Charles. You. Nice to see you too. It was good to see you. So again, that wraps up this episode of Beyond Some Figures podcast for more tips and information on taking your business beyond some figures. Also check us out at predictableprofits.com. Again, that's predictableprofits.com. This is Charles Get Out with my friend, Michael Bongay. Stanier, and I will see you in another episode.